Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. And uh, we'll start with Anna from UN Women and her opening remarks. Thank you, Sonia, and good morning, everyone. My name is Anna Feld. I'm from UN Women, um, leading our work on um, women's economic empowerment, which entails a lot, uh, women in STEM, women in technology, entrepreneurship procurement, and many other areas. Um, I'm so excited to be here. It's been a long process for us to um, look at all of the applications, um, almost 300 applications to the to the Equals in Tech Award um, to really figure out who are the ones that we should put here uh, with us today and share their experiences, lessons learned, the struggles. We hope you'll also hear some about the challenges um, and to learn from it. They're really, really great role models and uh, what we've heard in the, in the past few days is that we really lack role models. And one of the reasons why we have um, the Equals in Tech Award is to, to uh, promote more role models and, and women in tech. Um, it was the previous uh, GEM Tech Award um, that we've been doing for a few years, uh, but with the launch of Equals um, in September 2016, uh, we also rebranded the award so that we are now going in full force. You may know about the Equals from the past few days and from previous uh, encounters with Equals. We try to be in all of the conferences and spaces to spread the word about how we can bridge the gender digital divide. And as we're all sitting with our computers and, and mobile phones, it might be difficult to really understand the depth of this gender digital divide. We have about 1.7 billion women in the world who don't have a mobile phone. And we are trying to build the business case for the private sector and actors to really take action. Uh, we know, for example, a calculation of $170 billion market opportunities is in actually making sure that women get access to mobile phones. But at the same time, um, we as UN Women have been working with the Vatican in discussing uh, the connectivity as a human right. Is it a human right? Is it something that we should push as a human right? Or do we need to continue to work on the business case? Uh, and maybe we should continue on both um, fronts because we know that it has tremendous cost to, to society of not tackling these issues. And it's not only about giving access, it's about getting the adoption uh, to the technology and uh, that people know how to use it and use it to build skills. The good news is that um, women are much more likely to use the internet for learning purposes. So once we get them on board, we know that they will be using it more for, for those purposes. We also know that um, about 73% of women have endured cyber violence. And we talked a little bit about in the past few days about how that has cost to companies in terms of absenteeism, in terms of uh, lower productivity when women in general are faced with, with domestic violence and violence in the public space. We also know a little bit about what works and what doesn't work. Um, we know that public access to Wi-Fi is a good way to promote women's access to the internet. And we can see in many cities around the world that it has started to be um, a practice. We also know that household, when you're giving, uh, when one member of the household is buying a phone and get a second one free, that this will be given to a woman and that also enhances her access. We know that digital skills training works and it's important to also link this to access to finance, that the FinTech agenda is also brought into to these discussions. But um, I'm more excited actually to hear about our award winners and how they have tackled the issues of access, skills, and women's leadership. And not only are they uh, role models themselves, but they have also helped other women to um, get access and skills in the internet and become leaders um, in this space. So I would like to congratulate Naila, Kemla, and Roya for their amazing work, and I'm so excited to hear more about it. We heard a little bit yesterday, but we hope to have a little bit more in-depth discussion. So 
Thank you very much, and on, on behalf of you and women and, and our partners in with ITU and other uh, partners of Equals, I'm, I'm excited to be here. And uh, Sonia, over to you. I'd also like to congratulate uh, all the winners. So uh, Ma Naila from uh, Lebanon and Kemler from Costa Rica and Roya from Afghanistan. We're going to hear a bit more uh, about their amazing projects. But what we also want to focus on is the challenges they faced and how they overcame them. So it can be uh, an inspiration and there's some lessons to be taken for everyone else who'd uh, like to help close this uh, gender divide around the globe. So if we would just start from uh, Nyla, what were the, yeah, what were the greatest challenges that you faced working on your project? Is it working? Yes. <laughs> can, I just <laughs> can I just mention the hashtag uh, equals in tech? You also have it on the banners mm -hmm. here. When I was little, I wanted to become a judge, but they told me it's not a girl job. <laughs> so I became a teacher and used a ruler instead of a hammer. <laughs> this could look like a, jo a joke, but this is the reality of girls and technology. Technology is a boy job. And so girls don't even dare to come near these kinds of jobs. So. I will be telling you the story of our project, Girls Can Count, and while telling you the story, I will be sharing our constraints and what response we, we, we gave to those constraints. How much time do I have? Mm -hmm. I'm always afraid in Switzerland. Well, we'll, we'll start with by, uh, three minutes each. Okay. But <laughs> So LAL is a Lebanese NGO. It's a small NGO founded in 2014. It believes in, uh, equ uh, in equitable access to quality education, and we mainly do uh, digital education. We have a platform. It's called Tapshura. Tapshura means choke, chalk. I don't know. Am I? Cré, c'est la cré. And uh, the objective of Tapshura uh, was relevant with the Syrian refugee crisis. It aims at filling the gaps and, uh, and uh, uh, help students, uh, at least Syrian refugee students, keep up with school. It's, it also helps, Liba uh, it's also a support for Lebanese uh, children. We focus on discovery activities and reasoning skill. We have curriculum, extra curriculum in three languages. The three languages used in Lebanon, Arabic, English, and French. So this is very, very briefly who we are. How did we uh, came with the Girls Can Count project? Well, during our field visit, we do not teach. We only provide resources and training, but we go and assess our uh, 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 resources. So uh, during our field visit, we noticed the inequality of education between boys and girls, although the rate of secondary girls in school, at least in Lebanon, is, and you may be surprised, higher than boys. Because of the economical crisis, boys are taken out of school to work. So there are more girls in school than boys at the secondary level. But those girls have different education than boys. Uh, a lot of them have, while boys have, technology or computer lessons, they have uh, hairdressing or sewing or uh, li li this kinds of wor workshops, especially when I go into the refugee uh, community in Lebanon. And one day we were checking the equipment of a computer uh, room of a computer lab and one girl, uh, her name was Lama, she came to me and said, I want to be a computer engineer, but they don't let me have the computer courses. They take me to hairdressing. I don't want to be a hairdresser. I want to be a computer engineer. And the friend who was with her, Rasha, she told me, and me, I want to be an architect. And she showed me the, her house, who was completely destroyed by the war, rebuilt by her. So she was drawing the house with a garden, with vegetables. And so here came the idea of the Girls Can Count project. The Girls Can Count project aimed at reinforcing uh, STEAM skills for secondary girls, uh, fighting against stereotypes and tradition, and helping them access their dreams. So uh, we, uh, we do STEAM activities. 
in order to help them uh, to help them do so uh, and we face and i will come to the constraints we face several constraints constraint one was convincing the family that girls will not meet bad boys uh, while using the computer but this this was a main uh, a main issue uh, we don't want our girls in front of a computer. They will use this uh, social uh, media and they will meet boys. And uh, one of the solution, it's not perfect. Uh, it was to have informal meeting with the families. Uh, basically, we had food and drinks, so they so they they were uh, they, they were coming, and we would try to let them see our resources, discuss with them, etc. The constraint too was convincing the school and the teacher to change their teaching habits, introduce ICT. And the solution we found was considering the school as a partner and giving it the visibility. Visibility was important for the teacher's management. And recruit some of the best teachers to be our champion and to help other teachers use the technology in class and providing them with a small amount of money so they will do this seriously. Uh, constraint number three was devices. This is why we partner with an NGO called Zeki that provide refurbished computers and other who provide also refurb uh, no low cost tablets. Constraint number four and the biggest one was access, and the solution was uh, uh, the box. Uh, the box I'm showing you use the uh, uh, Raspberry. I say I'm showing you the box because you are looking at your computer. Look at my box. <laughs> <laughs> so the box is a tiny server. It's uh, it's a Raspberry Pi technology. So it's a mini server. We uh, put all our content on a memory card, so it's very easy to replace. Uh, when we we do more activities or we change our activities. Uh, this tiny server, uh, hotspot, the wireless, uh, 30 computers. So a whole uh, computer uh, room. We are using it in community center. We are also using it in tented facilities. And we also in Lebanon have uh, electricity problems. So we can, ho we, can, uh, we can put the power bank and it have 10 hour electricity free uh, autonomy. Uh, the last constraint uh, I will be talking about is the learning gaps and language gaps. We first wanted to do STEAM uh, problem-based approach. We were very excited about that. It didn't work. It didn't work because girls uh, had uh, severe gaps. So they couldn't use resources to reinvest into finding solution to, to, to problem. What we did is that we, we, we did a two-level uh, two program. The first level was giving the girls basic resources, basic concepts in science or math, and then uh, having a STEAM uh, exercise and linking the STEAM exercise with the resources they have already studied and we have already developed, and of course others so they can use other resources. The other difficulty was the language. In Lebanon, we teach science, math, in French or English, not in Arabic. And for Syrian refugee, it was uh, uh, a, big, uh, a big issue. Uh, we had the chance to partner with an Oxford fellow, Dr. El Masri, on a research about designing tasks and ask his asking questions. And we had some very useful recommendation I could, I know I, didn't respect my time, so I will share it with you later if you're interested. <laughs> in order to not to go back, but very shortly, Naila, um, I want to talk about it's usually the STEM has science, technology, engineering, and math, yes. but you have added art to it. Yeah. So very shortly, why did you add art, uh, and what was the effect? I and will be made very it short. possible. <laughs> It's a big discussion in the education world. Is art part of STEM or, or no? So it's uh, some, some are with, some are, it's a debate. But I, I cl I, we clearly think that art is a plus to STEM, 
to STEM art is a, is a creative way of, uh, of using creativity to solve problem also. So we can use science, technology, and creativity uh, to solve some problems. Thank you very much. And now to uh, Kem Lee, also well, definitely not three minutes, <laughs> three, five minutes. And could you tell us shortly about your project and the challenges and how you overcame them? Thank you very much. Um, my name is Kemli Camacho. I'm from uh, Sulabatsu Cooperativa. It's um, a cooperative uh, in, based in Costa Rica, but we work in Central America with partners or in all the countries in Central America. Our project, the name of our project is TICAS, and uh, now it's TICA Central America. And um, the focus of the, of the project is in the IT industry. We are interested to uh, create more opportunities and more conditions for women to be integrated in equal uh, conditions, yes, in the IT industry. Why we want that? Uh, first, because it's, uh, it's related with the economic rights of the women at this moment, at this time in the history, yes, um, it, the digital technology is built is mostly by men. The digital technology we are uh, using for our daily life is built basically by men. Um, but this is, this is not a good issue. We need more women integrated in the IT industry, in the high level, uh, doing high level uh, technology, um, and, uh, and then this is the focus of our project. All of that began in 2011 when we have had some conversations with young women uh, who were uh, studying informatics, computers, and other related careers. And they tell us about all the difficulties they have to really open spaces in an industry who has only 20% or less women integrated, yes? And then the difficulties were not just uh, in, the, um, in the IT enterprises, in the IT industry, but also in the university careers, also in the informatic careers, also in the, in the technical careers uh, related with IT. Uh, that began in 2011 when we have had this discussion, and uh, then um, we, we began to try to um, define how we can open these spaces, but open these spaces with the young women, yes? Then this is, that was one point where we began all this project. The second point is when we discuss with the young women uh, in the IT sector, they tell us that first, they wanted to come back to their territories, to their own territories, to use the technology to develop their own territories. Many of them came from the rural areas to study in the, in the universities, in the, in the urban areas, or they study in the different uh, headquarters in, in rural areas, in the universities or, or institutes. Or, but one, interest of women is to really use the technology to develop their own territories. They want to come back and develop their own territory. Then the combination of these two issues, we want to develop our territories and we want to open opportunities for women in the IT sector uh, were the, the seed of TICA's uh, pro, uh, program, yes? Um, then uh, based on that, the first uh, thing we decide is how do we, it's impossible for just one woman in one class. I teach in the university informatics and I always have 30 guys and one girl, yes? Or 30 guys and two girls. Then it's impossible for her to really have a leadership in the IT sector when they are, they are one or two in three, in, in third, with 30 guys, yeah, with 30 uh, men. Then uh, the first thing that we do is begin to create a network between women in the IT or interested, interested in IT development. 
develop a network between them, and we began meeting, discussing, and creating proposals together, yes? And this network is growing up, is growing up. Now we have not just one network, but we have different networks in different parts in the country and now in Central America. Then we have networks who connect, who create proposal, who, who propose to even to the, to the universities how to um, develop an, an IT career more inclusive, yes, less, less um, expulsive of the different. Because uh, something that is important also is in the IT sector, this problem is not, not just for women. It's also, for instance, for Afro-Caribbean. We don't have Afro-Caribbean people inside the IT industry, or we don't have a lot of indigenous people inside the IT industry, or even people with, dis with disabilities. We don't have a lot. Then we have to create a new IT industry who integrate the diversity, beginning with women, because we are, we are the half of the population. Then one of the ways that we, and, uh, that we, we work on that is creating the, these different networks to support each other, to support each other, to integrate other women's interest and in develop the IT industry, interest in develop IT in general, interest in creating technology. And, and we grow up and grow up in networks and sub-networks who connect to each other. This is one thing. The other thing is we began to develop the technological poles in the rural areas with the leadership of women. Then these women, many of these women already graduated, come back to the rural areas and began to develop their own enterprises and their own uh, software yes, and their own uh, uh, technology for the, uh, for the rural areas. And we began to develop a local digital economy very connected with the needs of the rural populations. Then this is the second part we have done. We have different strategies. I'm not going uh, on depth, in depth on that. But for instance, we have clubs of girls and technology, mothers and technology. We have um, a club for no drop off of women in IT careers. We have uh, hackathons for women to develop ideas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we support all the entrepreneurship, uh, uh, IT entrepreneurship uh, by women. Uh, okay, again, um, very shortly. So mm -hmm. were there any differences between uh, working with women in rural areas compared to urban areas, or it, are the challenges so similar that the solutions are the same? Very shortly, please. Mm -hmm. No, uh, really there is a big difference working in the rural areas than in the urban areas. Um, just to mention two or three, uh, one is the stereotypes and patterns in the relationship between women and technology is uh, stronger in, in the rural areas, yes? Um, the second is, of course, we have the difficulty with the, with the access to the technology and we have to create solution, innovative solutions to, to have access to the inter good access to develop in a, a, a digital economy in the rural areas. Then we have to be very creative on that, mm -hmm. yes? And also, uh, there are more opportunities in the urban areas, definitely. There are more opportunities for finance, for training, for um, support, yes? And uh, we need to develop policies to develop a digital economy in the rural areas with the lead of women. Thank you. And um, now to uh, Roya, again, what were the uh, challenges that you faced? And by the way, after, after Roya, we're going to open the floor for questions, so uh, both uh, in situ participants and remote. But yeah, first, Roya, can you tell us a bit about your project and your challenges? Sure. I, w uh, I wanted to start it from where, when I connected to the computer. I was grew up as a refugee in Iran, and we back to Afghanistan in 2003. But uh, I found that it's very difficult uh, in Afghanistan to find even a, a book to be updated with the information that I could learn in the schools. 
and uh, the other problem that we living in the houses that was separated from each uh, the big walls separated all, all of us from each other it wasn't jail but it feel like a jail and I always th thought of that how I can find information outside how I can have access to the outside world then I in 2003 everything changed there was an internet ca cafe open in Herat and only my brothers and cousins could, uh, could go there and a good girl wouldn't walk in but I was insisted to go there and, um, and I refused to give up my dream. And one day I was walking in this inner club and for the first time I used the internet. And at that day, everything for me changed. And I found out that there are more than out than what was around of me. And I decided at that moment to make technology the center of my career. I went to the school, graduated from computer science. I started my business in 2010 with my youngest sister, uh, the first company of technology that a woman was a CEO in Afghanistan. But being tech female CEOs anywhere in the world will introduce you some obstacles. In Afghanistan, that the women are not supposed to work outside, the attack against of me was devastating, both personally and professionally. We couldn't have access to the financial and law line that is very difficult for any woman who starts businesses. We had also the challenges of the security, the cultural barriers, uh, technical support, everything that you can imagine we had uh, challenging with that. I, uh, they also started to send a threat to, I mean, Taliban sent the threats, and we had, uh, we had to deal with the conservative male-dominated IT industries that they didn't want so that we could continue to work, to follow us. And they put in on a spy, they accuse us that we are a spy of outside. And many of these challenges that I found out that it's very difficult. And, but if I was created, what message I could send to the many of the girls who want to have the same career? So I decided to not uh, quit, but we become as a digital entrepreneur. So that's why technology helping us, that to lower our physical address, but make our presence online. And in this way, I found my investors, I keep continue to find the clients outside, and um, I continue the work that I would love and created more jobs for the women. But then I found that, that um, there are millions of the girls who are out there just like me, curious, but giving no vision to explore the world. So we wanted to change everything for them, so that's why we started the Show Film Fund. And uh, giving the women access to technology, pro uh, building the IT centers inside of the schools. And for me, it's a very important to building them, to provide training for the girls for, from young age, because the many of the girls in Afghanistan, they married under the age of 18. So we started to try to provide a training at the age of 12. They learn about computer, they learn about social media, they learn about coding. And, uh, and it was great, but then we had also the challenges of the conservative uh, society that they don't want the girls to learn about technology. One of our colleagues has already mentioned that uh, families always say that technology or internet bring the bad values, especially for the girls, they don't want to have access to technology. So we decided to tell them that, well, it's not about the internet, it's a creative job opportunity for your girls. So with the respect of the traditions, they can continue and make money and uh, they can involve with their families. So we built a platform that allowed the women to write the blog and then they can uh, share the, with the other people and then they can make money with, uh, with uh, the platform. And uh, then we had a challenge that how to pay the users. Then we bring the Bitcoins in 2013 uh, in Afghanistan. But then, um, then we had the challenges of 2014 when the Americans and many of the uh, international donors left, there, was enough, there wasn't enough jobs. So we got the unemployment rates in Afghanistan. Many of the graduated from university had a challenge to find a job, however, the students from this high school. So then we introduced the financial literacy to the, to the, to the program that was totally game changing. We teach the kids how to learn to manage the money from level of home to level of entrepreneurship. That was totally, uh, with the tech, was totally game changing. And the family was super happy because uh, the girls started to helping the family in uh, terms of to how to finance, how to do the taxing, how to do accounting, saving, and everything that could help them. And then last year, we helped them to also start their own startups. So with the financial uh, literacy training and as well the tech uh, uh, skills, now they started to have 100 women to start their own startups. Most of this age between 12 to 18 years old. We have a student who has 16 years old and have 25 people work for her. We have a student that eight months ago it started a uniform shop and she already made it $8,000 and she is only 14 years old. So it's a lot of the money. Now they are started to support on their families. We make them as a role model for other girls and other communities that they can, um, they can look at them and they, um, they say, okay, if she can do that with respect of the tradition and the culture, so our girls can do the same. But a year ago, that was all of the projects that I have done in Afghanistan had a great impact in the society. But one of the things that was totally changed everything. 
it was a robotic team that probably, I don't know if you have heard about that. A year ago, there was a um, uh, first blue baller contact me and asked me to build a robotic team to bring it to the international, comp international competition. And I thought that why not to make all team of the girls? So it's different this than the math issue to hold on as well, uh, all the girls and women in Afghanistan. So we built this team, we brought it, I mean, with a lot of like difficulties, we finally brought them to the US. But what is make it interesting about this team, when we were in Afghanistan, the government and leaders tried to ignore us. And for three weeks we were in the, all the news, but they didn't want to say even one word that they are proud of these girls. They even didn't recognize us. It's like centuries that they ignored the women's ability in science and technology, they did the same with us. But we didn't want to be quiet. So that's again, technology helped us to give a voice and talking with the media, with the social media, and, and telling everybody about our stories. And that's bringing us to the United States. But when we back from the United States, it was totally changed. Any last few comments before you wrap up? I said that when we back to Afghanistan, things, everything changed. After centuries that the women's abilities ignored in science and technology, now the community changed their view about the women's ability. So I was going to ask about like, um, what were the aspects that uh, that would help or like the best practices that would help um, women become more active in STEM areas in more um, societies where gender roles are much more traditional. But I think you already answered that as in hi highlighting the economic aspect of things helps uh, families and the society be perhaps more open. Could we say that? Exactly, yeah. yes. So I'd like to take uh, questions from the room or if we have any questions online for our participants. Well, they presented it so well that there aren't any questions. <laughs> no, no, no. Hello, good morning. Uh, first of all, congratulations to all of the three winners um, for your extremely important work. Uh, I'm very um, amazed and overwhelmed after your presentation. Thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Birgit. I work for the German government in the Ministry for the Development Corporation. And uh, in 2017, Germany uh, headed the G20 presidency. So um, we pushed very hard to put the topic of the digital gender divide on the agenda of the uh, development working group. And we are very proud that at the end um, we made it, uh, well, uh, twen the 20 biggest economies committed to promote digital skills uh, for women and girls to overcome the digital gender divide. Uh, so this is at the policy level, um, but still we know that there's a huge gap between the policy level and the political will, and on the other hand of uh, the important work at the ground that needs to be done. And uh, so I'm very glad that there are these important initiatives that you are taking uh, um, actively on board. And I would like to ask you about uh, the financial issues. How easy, or how difficult is it for the three of you um, to get uh, financial sustainability for your activities? As I understood, for example, Ruth from, Afghani from Afghanistan, I heard that uh, you're really making uh, out a business case out of it. So maybe it's self-sustainable because, um, yeah, it's a business model. But I would like to hear from you um, what is the model of sustainability of your activities and how easy or difficult is it for you to get funding for your activities? Thanks a lot. If everyone could uh, limit their answers to like two minutes to step, it would be great. And from Roya to Kenley to Nagla. At the beginning, I started from my local company to finance every of our projects. But uh, later, when I left at Afghanistan, uh, we started Digital Sun Fund. And it's very, very difficult to raise the money to the donors or to the writing the grants. So that's why we are trying to right now to making focusing on to make it sustainable. One of the way is that we started with uh, these startups that they making uh, money. They can giving it to persons to the foundation that we can keep continue to work. And the other thing is that we are going to also start a coffee and tea business that we buying the spices from our students who are working in the farms, bring it to the US and selling the, the coffee and tea that it will be launched in January for the week and next two years we will make it sustainable. The third thing that we are right now working on is that uh, the innovations that we are working with the STEM schools that uh, we are going to build the first STEM schools in Afghanistan that one of the part of these STEM schools innovation centers that connected to be, be as an incubator place that make it uh, totally like sustainable our program with the longer term. 
um, it's always difficult to get some financial support for the activities. Um, in our case, something that is very, very important for us is the alliances. We have a strong alliances, for instance, with universities, with, with the schools, with the private sector, with the public sector, or, and, the, and with international uh, cooperation. All these alliances uh, put something in the project. Yes, for instance, in the universities, we develop uh, all the infrastructure is based in the universities. Yes, then they put the infrastructure. From the public uh, sector, for instance, we get some scholarships for the women and for the girls to come to the different clubs. Then we try to, to get a, a specific support from the different alliance. Then in this way, we, uh, we, we finance yes, the, the project. At this moment, we have the support of Google.org Google uh, to expand the project to Central America, and we have had the support of the Gender Equity form, Fund from UN Women. Uh, but uh, the project is based in alliances. Uh, you won't be surprised if I say very difficult too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, especially that some funds are heavy, so it takes too much work to write reports, uh, to answer some, uh, to get uh, the, the program running, so it's easier not to have them. <laughs> uh, we have two solutions. One of the one of our solution we have presented to the WISE Accelerator and been selected. So we will work on a sustainability idea because we are completely free. Everything we give for free, boxes, programs, etc. So we're working with the WISE for our sustainability. The other is collaboration and volunteering. We work with a lot of retired teachers and young, freshly graduated students who need experience. Something else that I'd like to hear from all of you is, uh, I want to talk about the Equals in uh, Tech Awards a bit, and shortly, like, what does the award uh, mean to you? Why do you think it's important? And what are your uh, plans for your initiatives, or are there any new initiatives for the following year in 2018? Yeah. You keep going right and left. <laughs> Uh, for me, the Tech Award was uh, uh, very important on different level, mainly uh, because of the recognition. It's related to what I was saying from how, how, how heavy some funds are. It's a recognition of small initiative. It is the idea that with an, with an idea, with a small initiative, you can do uh, big things. And this is really important. Uh, we are a small young NGOs, and we are uh, very uh, honored to, to, to have been, uh, been selected. Uh, what did you ask me to? Oh. <laughs> um, what are your near-term near plans for your initiative okay. in 2018? So for the moment, we are doing, uh, I, will, I will share my dreams, in fact. For the moment, we are doing curriculum, uh, we are doing activities related to school because we are answering a need. But I think there is another need that I would love to, 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 to fill. I don't know if you say to, to fill. Uh, it's uh, extracurricular activities. I would love to use digital to bring to deprived community arts, music, uh, uh, sci uh, science like astronomy, uh, things like that. So to use the digital to make them uh, discover uh, art and culture and music and singers and dance. I, I think it's amazing how you're bringing together the digital and technology with the more creative areas. So again, congratulations. And Kim Lee. Um, uh, for us, the war is really something exceptional. It's, um, I don't know, is that is uh, really important for, for us to be recognized for this work in the IT industry and uh, based in the leadership of the young women. 
um, networks. Um, it's not just for us, it's also for the partners and the alliance who are around the, who are around all these projects. And it's in a special recognition for the young uh, women who are uh, trying to change the, the IT sector. Uh, also for me, it's very important to recognize the 293 initiatives that have been presented. I think equals is, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, crucial to recognize that we as women, we are trying to do a change, we are trying to change the, the, um, the so digital society. Um, and in terms of the future, uh, we hope we can really have a model proved, tested about how to develop um, technological poles in the rural areas with the lead of women. We really want to have a conceptual model, yes, to offer uh, to, to the world and to have success, especially in the northern part of Costa Rica where we, where we have been working for the last four years developing this technological pole. And uh, also this uh, uh, scale up to I'm sorry, mm -hmm. by, by poll survey. Um, poll means clusters, maybe clusters, technological no. host okay, clusters. clusters. Okay. Yes, in the in the rural areas, and uh, um, also the other thing is the scale up to Central America is the plan for the for to begin now in 2018. Well, um, this award means uh, that uh, the world and especially the tech industries recognize the importance of the work that we are doing at Digital Action Fund. After many years that we are working with empowering women through digital literacy and also building communities. So it's absolutely a big honor for us to be recognized at this uh, such a great uh, stage. But um, also uh, it's encouraging us to keep continuing our dream and, uh, uh, and seeing that our project is enough important to, to continue to not be in only in Afghanistan, but is extended to many other countries. We're already in Mexico, we are going to extend it in Brazil. But two projects that we are going to do it in uh, 2018, one is that to build in the first school of the science, technology, engineering, art and maths, class animation centers in Afghanistan. Uh, to build in the next generation of the leaders in the science and technology. We want to make sure that Afghanistan uh, be in the eyes of the next generation in the next 20 years, be a country of the source of high tech, whether a country of the throw and war. The second thing that uh, we also going to focus is to build, uh, to launch our uh, e-marketplace uh, for the women who are who have a small and medium-sized business uh, that to help them to have a smart contract, they can give in a loan, they can also have the access to the networks, uh, uh, educational material, and um, uh, yeah, that's also another uh, project that we are uh, focusing on that, that it's using the blockchain, is based on the blockchain platform as well. Hopefully we can have our own coin as well, but uh, for the next year it would be a blockchain platform. So since we started a bit late, I'm hoping we'll have a little bit extra time. Um, okay, I'll take a few questions from the floor and then we'll have um, closing remarks uh, by Carla from ITU. So, Hi, good morning. Um, so my name's Steph and I, I work in Egypt uh, at a center that, a research center that looks at access to knowledge and development. And I had a question inspired by what Ms. Naina said about the Lebanese experience because we've also encountered a bit of a challenge when it comes to um, teaching skills related to data, data analytics, because a lot of it is in English and then people speak Arabic. So I wanted to hear more about um, what do you guys all experience in terms of like language barriers and how that impacted who you could teach certain skills to or if you haven't or if you have ideas on or what your experiences were in mitigating this uh, language barrier, if you've encountered it. Thank you. Well, we are in the middle of a reflection about language barrier. Uh, the idea, the main idea is that expressed by the Syrian refugees themselves, they do not want to have the content translated into Arabic. They do not want to be confined in a closed, uh, so they want to, to, uh, to be open to the world and to, to learn in another language. How to solve it? We had three, we are thinking about three solutions. Uh, the recommendation for Oxford was very, ba was very basic, things like how to ask a question. 
repetition, uh, using the same uh, word in dif uh, different words for the same concept, etc. So we have recommendation, very useful. It was very, very useful. So you, you repeat and be, be direct. Uh, in the way you ask questions, so don't say uh, what do you think about, but say give me an answer. <laughs> this kind of, uh, of recommendation. The second idea was to have, and uh, this is also a debate, was to have it in, in, in mixed, it's, it's a lot now in Africa, to, to give uh, resources in two languages in the same time. It doesn't mean you have translated in another language. You use some of the word in Arabic, some of the word in English, technical words in English. And the more you, you evolve, um, on evolue, the, uh, we, we more we evolute, <laughs> the more you have more English and less Arabic. So this is, uh, this is uh, one way. And the third way is doing support activities related to every, uh, everything you are learning. So if you, d you do math, you do support activity in language specifically for math. Thank you, and there was a second question, uh, second participant, and then we'll go to you. My name is Josephine, I'm an ISOC ambassador. My question is, uh, through my work with women in Kenya, the challenge we face is that whenever, like we uh, do digital literacy training for them, but then after that, when they go home, they don't have access to devices or the internet is very expensive. So how can we be able to enable ac uh, affordable access to devices and also the internet for women? So is it for all the panelists? Okay, <laughs> okay, because we're um, running out of time. Who, who would like to take that? Well, if you could answer her um, briefly, then I will take maybe two more and we'll close. I think that uh, we have the same challenges in Afghanistan, that uh, many of the girls, they do not have access to the computer or not access to the internet connections. But now with the many of the devices that are coming cheaper and cheaper, it's make it much easier to have a smartphone. So there are smartphones that is cost of $50 or $60 and they can connect it to, to the internet. But actually they started in India and we have hoped to bring those devices uh, to Afghanistan that the other girls also have access to those devices in a cheaper and affordable cost. Uh, but in Afghanistan, we also have the 3G uh, access. So the only thing is that for many of the girls to know how to use the technology and how to use the internet. And, and I think that the same for many of the countries. If once they have access, uh, they learn uh, that what is this and what is these devices or what, how they can use the internet connection, they can find out uh, how they can um, um, get affordable cost and affordable internet connection. Depending again to the government and many of the uh, organization like Google is working in India and there are also the Facebook that they're providing the internet connections and in, um, just to doing the sending the messages in the smartphones. And uh, it's probably in the fu near future we can have uh, more access to the technology. Now that you mentioned Google and Facebook, I want to take advantage <laughs> of the position. And um, so what, what do you all feel about uh, the, the free services that they are providing? Is it, is it productive? Is it beneficial? Or are you uh, against it? Like things like free basic and internet.org, does it help? I think that internet, uh, like uh, Google.com, I guess that is was the first thing that it used for us very well. We find a lot of information free. So sometimes the free is good, but I understand that sometimes the free also create a problem because you gave a lot of information in your personal data that they will uh, take advantage of that. And um, one of the things that I feel that many of these big companies, they grew and grew and bigger, get bigger, bigger, bigger. It's good that they're also giving back to those communities that they get benefit of them, so. So maybe 50, 50, no. Yeah. Okay, um, la final. Questions? Yes, please, Lorraine. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, so congratulations again to, to our three winners. Um, it, it's great to hear more about uh, about what you're you're actually doing. Often in the in the UN, we, we talk a lot, and what, what's great to, about having all of you here is is we see the the concrete actions that can really make a difference in bridging the digital uh, gender gap. 
um, and, and thank you so much for highlighting the challenges that you have, you have all faced uh, in rolling out your initiatives. I wondered if you could very briefly comment on how you think you could scale your initiatives either within your countries or in other countries. Um, and also if you're measuring what happens after, uh, so what happens after women and girls are in your programs, are you able to follow where they go next? Thank you. I will answer the, the last question first uh, because we are at a pilot phase, so we do not have this kind of information yet. Uh, as for the scalability, we are, uh, what we're doing is that we are using uh, digital library and uh, partnering with Colibri, Khan Academy Light, Rami Tablet, and we are hoping to scale our content worldwide using uh, international concepts. Although we strongly believe in cultural identity and differences, so we are trying to uh, balance between both of uh, both approaches. In our case, and we are exactly at this moment in the scaling up of the project to Central America, then what we have done uh, first is uh, to develop like a model for now, a, a draft model, yes. Uh, but uh, in all the cases, we have uh, organization counterparts in each country, yes. Then we are developing now the, this draft model. We are integrating lesson learned from other organizations in Central America to grow up this model with experiences of others. We always like to work in networks, and also something very important is the alliance. We, we the alliances we are um, working uh, to create alliances, for instance, with university, with private sector in each country in Central America to support the process we are trying to scale up. Then, for us, it's very important the networking and the alliances with multi multi multi-stakeholder in all the countries to really uh, do the scale up. We also have um, a measuring model, yes. is not, um, it's, it's based in few indicators, but a lot of uh, histories, stories, yes. Uh, then uh, then it's, it's more based in the stories of change than in, uh, in measurement. We feel that all were related with women uh, actions is very much reflected in stories than in numbers. Then, uh, but we combine both, but we like stories. Yes? Sure. Uh, what we are doing is uh, we wanted to extend our works in uh, Brazil and Mexico and other countries in South of Asia as well. Uh, one of the things that we started for the Brazil is partnering with a company that they do recycling the technology stuff. So, um, uh, so whatever they, we pointed our partners that even donated the um, secondhand computers or electronic devices, this uh, company will collect them and they send the profits of the, those devices to the foundation that we make it sustainable in for Brazil. And then um, the other things that um, uh, we wanted to do is, is that partnering with a different uh, local organization or bigger organization to extend our work in uh, other countries. But for uh, terms of the measuring, uh, we do two methods. One method is that is a traditional way. We do the survey and uh, we will see that what's happening with our program. And uh, if the student, and, and we will see that if uh, we have some mistakes in our program, then we will change our new program. But then, uh, as Kamala mentioned, that it's, uh, I think that that's cool, but the most important thing is that how much we have successful story with one of our program. So for example, when I mentioned about the financial literacy, it was totally game changing because we had a lot of successful stories come out from the, the program. So we will look at uh, um, how much we can impact and how much we have successful stories that bring more impact in the society. In the past, we had contact with the students uh, through our platform. That uh, Through the platform, we have a communicate with the students who graduated. But when we shut down the platform, uh, we found out that it's very difficult to, to know what's happening in their lives. So now with the new project that we have, this e-marketplace, that the students who start their startups, now they're going to register, and we will be have a longer term to have communicated with them. So, uh, 
Um, unfortunately, we're uh, running out of time, and it was uh, an honor to be on the panel with all of you amazing women. And thank you uh, for inviting me as well. And uh, Carla, please, closing remarks. Thank you very much and good morning. It's always uh, very hard to, to, to say some, to give some concluding remarks at the end of this uh, inspiring uh, panel discussion. Um, it is also really very exciting, as Doreen said before, really to, to learn more about you and to also understand what are the real challenges. We have still a long way to go. Uh, we heard a lot about the stereotypes, uh, cultural barriers, uh, violence against women and girls. Uh, so we, we, we really need uh, to work all together and um, this is what EQUAS uh, is, is all about. And we recognize many partners in the audience, uh, of course, uh, uh, Germany, OSCHR, UNCTAD, ISOC, uh, of course, Switzerland and uh, Facebook. So thank you again for, uh, for, uh, for being partners of EQUAS, but also research members, uh, EQUAS research members like the, the University of Egypt. So thank you again. Um, this is, I mean, again, is uh, is what what Equals is, uh, uh, is is trying to do. So we really want to scale up uh, projects, but we also want to learn uh, and we also want to share information. Uh, so so we hope to to I mean to continue this discussion. Uh, I mean today is just the beginning, but we want to continue the discussion in in the next month. Uh, so follow us uh, online and, uh, and uh, follow our role models and uh, thank you again for, for being here. Thank you for everyone for being here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I will be closing the session. I declare the session closed. <laughs>